morning, welcome to Village. My name is Charlotte Bryan and I'm on staff here. Whether you're new today or you've been here for a while, please fill out a connect card before you leave. Simply use that card in the seat back in front of you or download the Village app for easy access to the digital connect card, the bulletin, and so much more. Just search Village Beaverton on your app store of choice. Are you considering the next step in your faith life of getting baptized? What does that mean for a follower of Christ? We have a wonderful and important baptism class coming up taught by Pastor Jim Clemenson. We'll cover readiness for baptism, Lordship of Christ, and what it means to follow Jesus. This four-week class is for anyone who wants to be baptized and begins Sunday, March 12 until April 2nd, 3 to 5 p.m. Register and find out more through today's bulletin. Village Women, we have our next event coming up on Saturday, March 4th. Join us as we specifically focus on the disciplines of fasting and praying. We'll dive deeper into strengthening these spiritual disciplines together to help us in our spiritual growth and our relationships as sisters in Christ. Join us this coming Saturday, 10 a.m. to noon, and please do RSVP through today's bulletin. Child care is available, so please register your kids as well. We so look forward to seeing you there. And calling all Covenantal members, we are nearing the end of our Covenantal membership renewal process. You received an email recently with a link to an online form, or you can pick up a paper form in the lobby and drop it off at the info counter. Please take time to complete this annual practice of self-reflection and renew your membership with our community. If you have any questions about membership, please email info at villagebeaverton.com. In today's service, we are welcoming back lead pastor Paul Choi to speak for us on Romans chapter one. But first, let's worship together today with the band and the vocal ensemble. Well, good morning, everybody. I would like you to just take a moment this morning to think of all the, that God has created. Take a moment of the things that he has allowed you to experience when you're out in the nature. Think about the things that you're grateful for. All the little details that he has placed in nature and also in us. And he created it all. We serve such a mighty and amazing God. What are the words that come to your mind when you think of God and who he is? There are many things that we can see, but the Bible says that God has placed in nature a way that we can experience him. We can know him by just looking of all the things that he has created. of the things that you want to worship God for. Think of the things that you want to praise Him for this morning.
Why don't we stand together? From the highest of heights to the depths of the sea Creations revealing your majesty From the colors of fall to the fragrance of spring Every creature unique in the song that it sings All exclaiming indescribable, uncontainable Shine. 
morning, welcome you to your home and to your family. We welcome you to look around and see any familiar or unfamiliar faces and greet one another and just say, I'm so happy you made it through the snow and the ice. <laughs> so go ahead and greet each other.
villager. <laughs> uh, my name is Naomi Shraiwa. I am in a village church since almost a one and a half years when Japanese fellowship joined the village. At the time, thank you so much for having us that part of uh, your community. And uh, today, um, I'd like to share uh, my story. Um, so last March, I lost my father by cancer. So when he got a diagnosis of cancer, it was already terminal and he made it three weeks in the hospital. And after he started chemo, he made it five days and um, uh, he passed away. And our family never expected he's leaving us so fast. So um, after he left the earth, um, our family had a really, really hard time to adjust and find the peace in the Lord. Even we trust, we believe my father is with him, our heavenly father without pain or with this comfort of sorrow, but we really, really miss him. And uh, since after um, his funeral, um, my faith of the Lord has been completely fail, like a broken pieces everywhere. And my hand just cannot hold as a prayer and start, I lost all the prayers. I know I have to find the joy and the rejoice to find because he guided me through and he walked me through this rocky path because he, I still can't count the all the blessing he had for me because even during the very strict COVID protocol, I was able to meet him and I was able to pray for him before his final breath. But it was so hard to losing a parent because I love him so much. And and then um, Pastor Yoshiki and Mariko uh, sent me a message and say they set up a meeting. That I'm in a Zoom meeting. And and Pastor Yoshiki's message say, hey, I just want to check in with you. But it turned out in the online meeting, it was counseling. It is a Christian counseling. I was almost, just like a one finger on a cliff, almost fall. But our Heavenly Father never let me to go down, 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 a deep place. Even I feel like I'm along, like I'm done to no one. I've been totally alone. Actually, I was not. I'm always scooped by his wing, righteousness hand. So I never be alone. They didn't judge me. They just share and they just totally understand my feeling, my struggle. And they never forced me to, hey, Naomi, you have to pray. You have to read a Bible or something. No, they just listen my my story, my struggle. And then after I all the Zoom meeting, I realized I feel like, okay, it's always someone pray for me and they give me strength. And then I realized, okay, I can do maybe um tons of paperwork because uh, you know my father passed away suddenly, so my mom had been left alone and she was more devastated. So I could do they set me uh, my vision to I can do a lot of things for my mom. And then I started walking to visit you know local office and government to do a lot of paperwork. And then it also bring my mom another strength, another hope to live again. Even she feel like a, she's been also alone, but she does realize, okay, she has more children to support her, as well as we have so many churches of friends, Christian friends, even she never met, but they pray for her. So that is, I, I feel like the community 
even I never met you, I do, I do believe we are community because we have faith in the Lord. Romans 1, 18 through 32. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godliness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they never glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like a mortal human being, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts, even their women exchanged natural sexual relations to unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they did what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. Good morning. My name is Paul Cho. I'm one of the pastors here at Village. Uh, it's so good to be uh, back and be worshiping uh, with you this morning in this ice wonderland. I'm so glad that you're uh, able to come and also grateful for those who are faithfully uh, joining online from wherever you are. First of all, uh, please excuse me from preaching while you're seated. Uh, today, I still experience shortness of breath uh, from my pancreatitis issue, uh, and this might be the best and safe way uh, to carry on the ministry today. This does not reflect I'm taking this responsibility anymore lightly. Uh, I cannot express enough uh, gratitude uh, for those who prayed and cared uh, for me over the past two weeks. I had two uh, health issues. One was to uh, remove my gallbladder uh, due to frequently recurring gallstone issues, including this particular episode. Uh, the other one was to deal uh, with some um, severe pancreatitis. Uh, former was a somewhat uh, easy procedure, but the latter <laughs> um, was very painful and took a longer time uh, to treat. It was a tough time, but was turned into a special time and eventually a good time. So thank you for your loving care and prayer, and please continue to pray for those who are going through uh, physical struggles and pains even this and next week in our own community. 
Um, I'm ready to share this message with you today with this boldness and confidence. Uh, and this is not a made-up message, uh, but this is from the bottom of, my, bottom of my heart, faith and belief in the gospel. Not from here, but from here, I would say. Uh, I've been looking forward to uh, and really wanted to preach on Romans chapter 1. While every preacher is tempted to say that every passage for that particular Sunday is his or her favorite one, <laughs> I still say that Romans 1 is especially a special passage that I desire to preach. Among us here, um, there are some of us who would say, I already know what the gospel is. I already know what the gospel is. I have heard it and know it all well. And for you, perhaps you've been anticipating a sermon series on Romans uh, that will confirm, reconfirm what you already know and believe. Or some, maybe some, some are thinking, uh, I love that village is preaching through the book of Romans because some other people, some other people definitely need to hear the gospel. And for others, you may have a conflicted heart regarding the gospel and the church in general. There are those of us who have believed since childhood. Once you believed, once you experienced the living God, once you created a space for God in your heart and in your life, it's hard for you to deny his presence and Christian claims even later in life. Even if you want to run away from God, whether you successfully detach yourself from a religious organization or activities or not, there will continue to be a reserved space for the divine being in your heart. And there will continue to be undeniable fear or reverence towards God. So you are continuing. Maybe because of that, you are continuing with this religious life as a Christian, at somewhere between nominal and practicing Christian. Uh, but there's, at the same time, some undeniable skeptical posture in you which you don't dare to touch. Is the gospel real? Is this really worth doing? Or am I actually fear-driven? Why are people still the way they are? And why is church the way it is? You see, skeptics of the gospel or skeptics of the church in a, in a deconstructed state, unknowing where to go next. And, and, and these are very natural, and it is okay to question those questions. For all those people, it is my desire that today's message will be about uh, the true, true gospel. It seems that most of us don't actually know, nor do we fully know what the gospel is. Let me say that again. It seems that most of us don't actually know, nor do we fully know what the gospel is. And I'm including myself in this as well. Some others of us have mistakenly, mistakenly reduced the gospel to a mere methodology or a solution, a formula with which and by which we could go get into heaven when we die, like a formula to believe in or agree with. Among those who claim to know the gospel well, well it's, it's about, I know something that others don't, and it's this formula, this method that must be shared. They are zealous in their duty to share and spread the, this gospel, perhaps out of duty, to save the lost and to obey the command, 
But in reality, it is possible that they do not know the essence and true meaning of the gospel, to the gospel of the kingdom of God. If how to get into heaven has been the only message that they've shared. So the question is, do you really know the gospel? Do I really know the gospel? And I'm serious in asking this question to every single one of us. Do I really know the gospel? Much of our understanding of the gospel comes from stories and narratives we heard and received as children. If you look at the faith life, the Christian life of some uh, is actually um, shamanistic. Their faith life is magical. God is the genie in Aladdin's lamp that we pray to. God is someone who hears my prayers. We think of him as a miracle maker. Try writing down your prayers. You will notice and be surprised at how much you've treated God in a shamanistic way, how you dismiss him to be a wish granter. Still others take the word of God and misunderstand the gospel and God by projecting and reading a narrative of good and evil, a narrative of good and evil, this, this paradigm of good and evil. Yes, it is true, meaning if you do good, you, you'll be rewarded. If you do bad, you'll be punished. This narrative of good and evil. It is true, uh, as Christians, we should do what is right and shun evil. But if we only see the Christian gospel as a moral teaching that doing good will be blessed and evil punished, then we are losing access to the heart of the gospel. We're missing the essence of the gospel. Indeed, we might misunderstand the whole story. What are the narratives we, we grew up with? We are very familiar with our stories of heroes, triumphal stories and our happy endings. Are these not the stories that we grew up with? Can we show it uh, on, on the slide? The stories we grew up with, what are the stories you heard and read in your childhood? And what do they tell you about the world? Heroes, stories of heroes, triumphal stories with happy endings. This formulated worldview, in other words, this kind of understanding and expectation of how things ought to be, this formulated worldview too can distort our view of the gospel. We might be seeing Jesus as the hero who will save us. So often we want Jesus to be our hero, fans in a fandom who follow a hero, Jesus, mistakenly equating, praising his glory as honoring him, treating him like a hero. But the Christian gospel is not like this. The Christian gospel is about following Jesus in life and death following Jesus, to really glorify God would not uh, be to simply uh, praise Him. It's about following His life. We love happy endings as we, uh, that, perhaps that's how our cultures might have shaped us. We love happy endings. A movie with a sad ending or a tragic ending does not sell as well. In the same way, our faith may be also founded on that expectation. God will one day set everything right. He will cause all pain to cease. He will restore all brokenness to wholeness. And, and this is not wrong. The Bible surely promises these things. But what do we actually mean by restoration and completion? If we were to take a deep, uh, take, take a look deep inside our, our, ourselves, you may be requesting and expecting the restoration, completion, and healing of all things, 
in the way you want. You want. Not necessarily in the way the Bible depicts. For example, if right now you are in the midst of pain in your life, maybe you'd comfort yourself like this. Right now, I can't understand why this is happening in my life. But one day in heaven, all will be understood. I cannot understand right now, but one day I can ask God, and then I will understand. Do we not say this? We choose to reserve our judgment like this and trust in God, and we call this, and we consider this a faith. In faith, we choose to endure. But will you really understand everything if you got to heaven and heard God's explanation? Would we? Would everything make sense then? What if Job in the Old Testament got to heaven and later asked God, why did you give me so much pain in my life? And God gave him an explanation. How did Job react after hearing the explanation? Would everything make sense? Is everything agreeable? Or would the explanation just make him even more furious. Perhaps we confine God's work in our lives to our rational understanding within our boundaries of happy endings and define it as restoration, as completion, in our own definition of it. When God may not be inherently, inherently rational, as Karl Barth says, at least within our understanding, perspective, and boundaries. So what is faith? What is true Christian faith that the Bible is demanding? True faith is not the expectation that later God will make all things right. True faith is not the expecta expectation that later God will make ev all things right. But true faith is that Everything God is doing now is right. Let me say that one more time. True, true faith is not the expectation that later God will make all things right, but that everything God is doing now must be right. True faith is confessing that everything God does is good, that God is good all the time. Think about the cross of Jesus, cross of Jesus. It's not that on the cross, Jesus was defeated for a brief moment, but was victorious when resurrected three days later. Momentary defeat, but glorious future? No way. If we have thought so, we have not yet understood the real meaning of the cross. What's the mystery of the cross? It's that the cross is the victory. It's not a momentary defeat, defeat, but it itself is a victory of God. This is God's very worldview. It's not that one day God will make all things right, but everything God is doing now is right. While comparing and contrasting the narratives of the world with the narratives of God's kingdom, we should constantly and critically reflect and correct ourselves within that, but rather we fall into our selfish desire and pride to fit the kingdom of God into the narrative of my own understanding of the world. Do you hear what I mean so far? So do we really know God? Do we really know God? Do I really know him as he is? Not in the way that I defined him to be. Are you sure that you really know the gospel? 
What story does Romans tell us? In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's a very modest expression from the apostle. Not ashamed, not embarrassed. Why would he say that? It's because others must have, or at least must have said, or at least felt that they are ashamed of the gospel. Why would people have felt ashamed of the gospel? If the gospel were a ticket to heaven, who would reject the gospel? Who would be ashamed of this gospel? Just for believing, you'd receive a cheap grace. You'd get a present just for believing. But that's the misunderstanding of the gospel. It's not that you are already happy with your life, but in order to be even happier, you follow Jesus? No, it's not like that. It's not that I'm already satisfied with my current life, but in order to lead an even better next life, that I follow Jesus? No way. Paul, the apostle, is saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because he realizes the narrative of Jesus, the story of Jesus, Jesus' worldview and Jesus' way of life and death is the true truth the true way to true freedom. Meaning, this way of life is the way, the truth, and the life. How did Paul describe the gospel in verse 16? He said in verse 16, the gospel is the power of God, the power to overthrow today's world, to overcome my life situation, a subversive, transforming power, a power that allows you to approach life in a whole new perspective. The gospel is powerful because it subverts. It really subverts your own ways. It overturns your posture and transforms your perspective towards everything, turning the whole world upside down down. The gospel is powerful because it awakens, it opens our eyes to see the, that the narrative of the kingdom, God's kingdom, is true, not the narratives of this world. It's very difficult for us to deconstruct and de-learn what we have already learned and are familiar with and then relearn a new set of narratives. It's very difficult, and this must be done by the Holy Spirit. The gospel is exhaustive and infinite, and understanding of the gospel, understanding the gospel does not end. When my ego is completely emptied, it's only then that his cup begins to overflow in me. Taking my 98% full cup and trying to add just 2% of Jesus is idolatry, arrogance, and shamanism. So in Romans chapter 1, Paul talks about the wrath of God. The wrath of God. It is written in uh, chapter 1, verse 18, that the wrath of God is being revealed. The wrath of God is being revealed. The NIV version did a good job in translating this particular verse, For it is important to look at the correct tense of this phrase. Some Bible, some other Bible translations, uh, some other versions translated to the wrath of God is revealed. But in fact, the phrase is in present continuous tense. The wrath of God is being revealed at this point right now. Why is so? When we think about the wrath of God, we might have the tendency to think, if I sin now, later I'll be punished. Or I I will be punished someday. But this premise, this assumption is incorrect, or at least that's not what this chapter is talking about in terms of the wrath of God. That's uh, That's closer to a narrative of good and evil. If you do good, you'll be rewarded. If you do bad, you'll be punished. The wrath of God is being revealed, says Paul, meaning it is happening now, in the present, right now, today. 
Yes, it will continue and continue to happen even in the future, and it will be complete, it, completed in the future, but it is primarily about here and now, the wrath of God. Suppose there is a man who lives a half, half, happy life, a very happy life. He has, um, as loving family, is financially well off, his children grew up well and got into prestigious schools. He has good friends around him and good relationships. He does good deeds, donates generously, and to anyone looking is, a living, is living a life of a faithful Christian. In everyone's eyes, he is succeeded in life, has a life to be envious of. But Romans 1 tells us that which is seen is not everything. Things are not just as they seem. The Bible says life is not judged and evaluated by the standards of world's narratives of what is good and what is evil. There are other standards by which life is judged and evaluated. When suddenly bad, thing happens, bad things happen in life, aren't there times when you think, maybe I sinned? Or did I something wrong, and am I being punished? But that's a vindic vindicative, um, vindictive way of thinking. In other words, a secular and popular narrative of good and evil. If you do good, you'll be rewarded. If you do bad, you'll be punished. What did I do wrong, so wrong that I'm being punished? That thought is based on this narrative, worldly narrative. Does the wrath of God really work? like that, immediately, immediately punishing the one who have just sinned? What is the wrath of God? Please pay attention to chapter 1, verses 24, 26, and 28. 24 says, Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. Verse 26 because of this, God gave them over to shameful lust. Verse 28, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Do you see a repeating phrase? In those verses, it is repeated that God gave them over. God gave them over. Another way of saying this, God gave them over, would be God is just leaving them as they are. God is just leaving them as they are. The wrath of God is to leave you the way you are as you go on the wrong path. God's wrath is exercised in his choice to leave you the way you are as you go on your own way. Suppose that you have joined a gang, lost yourself to drugs, made choices that will ruin your life, and God just leaves you alone. That's the wrath of God. God's wrath is not revealed through chasing you down and beating you. One of the greatest features of sin or characteristics of sin is that it is self-destructing. Self-destructing, self-destructive. Please remember this. Sin destroys itself as well as the sinner. It is scary. Sin is scary because it is destined to self-destruct. How the wrath of God show up for a human being who has fallen into sin that self-destructs. He's left alone just as he is. The world is full of people living their lives the way they want. They live pursuing their own happiness and following what they think is right, thinking and rationalizing that God will understand they live according to what is right in their own eyes. It might look like living in freedom, but a truer reality might be, might be that they are living under the wrath of God. To be left alone, that's the wrath of God. As C.S. Lewis has put it, 
Sin is the human being saying to God throughout life, go away and leave me alone. Then hell is God's final saying to the human, you may have your wish. To be left alone is the wrath of God. As sin destroys us and self-destructs, God is pained to see humans sin. Imagine a son or a daughter or a prodigal child who took the absolute wrong path, rotting their soul, one day returns to you, their parent, crying and pouring out their regret for all their wrong choices. How would you feel in heart? Would you be angry at them? Would you yell at them about why they lived like that, why they couldn't live a good life? Or would you, as their parent, share in your child's pain, pains that belong to the past, present, and future of the kid? Would you to share in their pain, imagining the pain and difficulty to come or the inevitable consequences to come in their future because of their wrong decisions. God does that too. Rather than being angry with us when we sin, he's deeply pained to see how sin hurts us and how it ruins our lives. He's a God who grieves for us in pain when he sees humankind sin. Of course, God can be angered, but that's not the primary image of God. In John chapter 8, when a woman was caught in adultery and brought to Jesus, he did not condemn her, but began to write on the ground, pained the woman had been living this kind of life until now. That's the heart of our Father, and who knows, perhaps the heart of the God, the heart of the Father God towards you this morning, full of pain and sorrow. For those who think that right now life is just perfect, everything is working out, well, it is possible that's true, good for you. But it is also possible that God is hurting for you. If regardless of God, I'm living the path I choose, if I am doing right in my own opinion, if I'm living a life in line with the worldly values, maybe God sees you and is pained. Perhaps like in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 3, I'm living like a child of wrath, children of wrath by nature who live in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind says Paul in Ephesians. Success and prosperity without Jesus, apart from Jesus, may be indeed the wrath of God in his truer eternal reality. If this is the case, what is the gospel? Before I get there, I must address that some claim Romans 1 is Paul's thesis against homosexuality. But I must say that this, that's a very narrow interpretation of the text. If you read the entire text, the latter half of chapter 1, you will see that Paul is referring to an overturning of the Genesis narrative. In other words, he discloses that the whole world and the whole people are living backwards to what God created and intended accusing the whole humanity, but not merely specifying homosexuality only. That's not the point here in this particular passage. Paul is accusing the broken world, a ruined world, a world living in hostility to God. But if God were just to leave a world like this alone, if that's the wrath of God, then what is the true gospel? That's my question. What is the true gospel then? What does chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 say? Verse 18, uh, first of all, said, the wrath of God 
is that the wrath of God is being revealed. Remember? But look at verse 17 now. How does Paul contrast this gospel reality? The righteousness of God is revealed. The righteousness of God is revealed. Church, this is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The righteousness of God is being revealed at the same time. In a world full of wrath, the gospel is that the righteousness of God is being revealed. What is this righteousness of God? It can be expressed in many ways, but I want to describe it this way. The righteousness of God is God's persistent love, His steadfast mercy, faithful grace, ceaseless zeal, and determination that do not leave us alone. Let me say that one more time. The righteousness, righteousness of God is God's persistent love, His steadfast mercy, faithful grace, and ceaseless zeal and determination that will not leave us alone. Traditional Reformed gospel teachings and the traditions of American revivalism tend to have implanted in our understanding that righteousness is only a judicial, legal term, meaning we receive this gift package called righteousness transferred to us from God, and we are judicially now set free. While this is, of course, theologically true, that's not the whole understanding of God's righteousness. God's righteousness is His persistent and faithful love that does not let us go. It's about God's sincere love for you, His determination and His zeal for your life. Instead of leaving you alone, this God is unafraid of choosing to intervene, pursue, restore, plant to the end, hold on to you, and chase. This indescribable, undeserved, steadfast, and persistent love of God expressed in His commitment for your life and for His kingdom, that's the righteousness of God. Not choosing to forsake the one who's walking a path of sin, but shouting to his back, trying to stop him, even at the cost of making him fail and suffer. Imagine a person who made a countless amount of money on Wall Street and was living a very successful life, a kind of life that everyone else would envy. On a sudden day, without knowing why, his life turns upside down. He loses all the money, his business falls headlong, suddenly his health fails. The world would say that he must have done something wrong before the Lord. He must have made a mistake, a poor life, a pitiful life. No matter what the analysis are, he failed his life now, says the world. But the Bible provides a different perspective and interpretation of what just happened. What if it was to stop him from living an arrogant and spoiled life? to take a look at how he has lived, consider how he now should live, a chance to return to what is right path. This may be a divine moment where the righteousness of God is being revealed in this person's life, not leaving him alone to continue living according to the values of the world, not leaving him under the wrath anymore, but stopping him so that he may see God truly living together with him, so that he may walk with God now, finding a true meaning in life, so that he may reimagine his life in light of the eternity. That's the righteousness of God, this persistent, faithful, steadfast, unchanging love and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus did not come to make your already good life even better. Jesus did not come to make you happier 
whereas you are already pretty happy with your life. Jesus came to show those who live according to the narratives of the world what a life worth living is truly about. Jesus came to show us what true freedom is like. Jesus came to show us what, it's, what it is like to truly live this life in light of the eternity. Jesus demonstrated to us that the way of the cross, this life of a cross, is the most beautiful, the most glorious, the most victorious way of living a given life. And he has sent us the Holy Spirit so that he would enable us to live such a life if we dare to, a life of the gospel, true humanity, a life as a follower of Jesus, a life as a child of the righteousness of God is the wrath, a life of the one who has seen the one who is the way, who is the truth, and who is the life. The apostle says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why and how is he saying this? The apostle believes in the gospel, not because he wants to be personally blessed by believing, like a transaction. Paul believes in the gospel, not because he thinks if everyone would believe in this gospel, the world will become a better place to live. His reason and pursuit for the gospel is not based on such optimistic calculation and triumphal expectation. The reason for Paul to believe in the gospel is because he knows that this is the truth. It's because he has seen the Lord, the life of Jesus, the way of his living and dying. And he knows now that this is how it's supposed to be from the beginning. Life of Jesus, which is the way, the truth, and the life. He now knows that this is the right way to live, the right path, a life that follows after Jesus. He's not ashamed of the gospel, a life not as a child of wrath, but a life as a child of God's righteousness. This second half of Romans chapter 1 actually presents a great challenge for us today. It compels us though, to change the way we pray. It compels us to change the way we pray. It challenges us to change the content of our prayers for ourselves, for our families, for our neighbors, and for our world. Lord, let my children be well. Make my family healthy. Let us live a happy life. In light of Romans 1, perhaps this may not be our best prayer. Instead, what about these prayers? God, please do not leave me alone. If I am just doing as I please, do not let me continue living this way. Please stop me. Please hold on to me. Please reshape me, redirect me. Shouldn't we change our attitude and content of praying for ourselves, our family, our neighbors, and the world? This message in Romans directs us to reinterpret our lives. It subverts our perspective, interpretations, and prayers for your own life and for the ones around us. Having said that, can we really say we know the gospel now? Are you really following Jesus? Are our prayers reflecting the fact that we are really following Jesus? Are we really no longer children of wrath, but the children of God's righteousness? Are we okay today? In other words, do you know do, do you now have the courage to pray this prayer? Lord, do not leave me alone. Twist my life. Intervene my life. Take control over my life so that I may live 
for your glory in the way you intended it to be. Do you have the courage to pray this prayer? Would it be out of duty and heavy heart or out of freedom and joy? What about your prayers for others? Do you have the courage to pray this prayer? Lord, do not leave my children. Do not leave my husband. Do not leave my wife, my family, my friends alone. I know they are living for their own good. Do not leave them alone. Intervene in their lives. Interfere on the way. Take control over their lives. Twist their lives so that they would see you. Even at the cost of experiencing failure and disasters and sickness, even at the cost of losing everything, Lord, let your persistent love turn them around back to you, towards you. Are you really wanting to say this prayer? Are you ready to say this prayer? So to believe in the gospel or to be a follower of Jesus, if you like, demands changing everything in our life. It demands changing our posture towards life as well as perspectives to interpret the things and experiences around us. The gospel truly transforms our narratives. It changes our dreams and prayers. It changes the things we value in life as well as the meaning of a good life. Will you still accept this gospel? Will you still not be ashamed of this gospel. Surprise, surprise. For those who believe the gospel, this way of life, that, that this way of life is a life of salvation, that this is a life of true freedom and liberation, that this is a life of truth, that this is a life filled with true power, a powerful and victorious life, this is the gospel given to us, which is the power, truth, and freedom. Will you receive this gospel? Will you really receive this gospel and rejoice in this gospel? What will you now live for? What will you now pray for? So Church of Christ, this is my prayer. Arise. Arise. Bride of Christ, arise. Let this gospel truth fill the entire world as the waters cover the sea. Let us live our lives by declaring that Jesus is truly the Lord, that the way he lived was the way, is the truth, and is the life. Let us demonstrate this gospel truth through how we live by the power of the indwelling spirit. The gospel makes all things new. The gospel restores your life. This gospel makes dry bones live. And this gospel brings dead back to life. May this gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ be a true source of hope to some of us today. Amen. Church, we're going to invite you to meditate on these words as Pastor Paul spoke as we continue to listen to the Spirit. We're going to invite you to sing this with us, um, but meditate on what it says. Think about it. Listen for what God is trying to tell you. What is he stirring in your soul today?
like to invite you to have a time of offering. And we are, I'm going to invite the, the people to come for it, forward and to reflect and to respond to this song and offering as well. Amen. Amen. My name is Ben Spots, and I'm privileged to be on the staff here. And uh, whether you've been to Village many, many times, or whether it's your first time today, um, I believe that God is alive, and He wants to twist our lives in good ways this next week. He wants to speak to us. So I'm going to invite you to just raise your hands as I pray a short prayer, a short benediction over us. So may you grasp how wide and long and high and deep 
is the love of Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul tells us, it's a love that surpasses knowledge. And may you constantly reflect upon and rejoice in the fullness of the gospel. As Pastor Paul reminded us, it's about living the life God intended for us and believing that what God is doing now is right. So may your frown become a smile this week as you think about the power of the gospel to redeem the world. May your heart beat faster as you recall how he's rescued us from destructive living and how he's renewed our minds. Be bold, church. Tell others what you've seen, what you've heard, and may you go in peace. Thank you for being here. Amen. to live in chains now there's a key within you